welcoming everybody to us in the region here and those who are joining us from um, um, afar. Bula and welcome to everyone. This video is being recorded. Um, we are also live streaming on Facebook. I would like us to just give a special welcome to our distinguished panelists. Um, thank you for your time and helping us to navigate this contentious um, conversation on deep sea mining in the region. Just to our panelists, um, if I can just encourage you um, to um, keep your camera on when you're speaking. However, we understand about there being connectivity issues in our um, areas. And if there is, feel free to turn off your camera while you're speaking, but leave your mic on. We also appreciate that others uh, would me up. Thank you, Honor Honorable Enele. Okay, so this proceedings for our call today, um, it's, uh, I'm co-moderating this uh, webinar with my colleague and dear friend Maureen. It'll be in two parts. I will take the first part, we'll, which will ent entail Hello. presentations. Can you hear me? Honorable Enele, I can hear you. Are you able to hear me? Honorable Enele, I don't think he's able to hear me. Hello? Hello? Hello, Anna, Honorable Enele, are you able to hear me? We can hear you. Hello, Honorable Enele. Okay. Am I connected now or not? Are you able to read to hear me? Yes, yes, Honorable Enele. You are connected and we can hear you. Are you able to hear me? I will continue with the uh, welcome and we'll get our tech team to contact Honorable Enele to check his, his mic. To our audience, on behalf of the Pacific Collective calling for a global ban on deep sea mining, I would like to welcome you all to the Drawing the Pacific Blue Line webinar series as mentioned, my name is Marioni and I join Maureen as co-moderator in today's webinar. We join you from our respective homes in Suva, Fiji. Today's webinar is titled Currents of Change, a political movement against deep sea mining in the Pacific. We are joined by, by, by a panel of political leaders from Oceania and they will be sharing their experiences as leaders from Pacific jurisdictions on how to deal with one of the most controversial issues today on ocean and ocean governance, deep sea mining or DSM. How to balance economic benefits. Oh my gosh. With long term ocean sustainability and what is the role ocean science plays to ensure the health of ocean of the ocean for future generations. Our five speakers today, we are so honored with their presence. The Maori party leader, Honorable Debbie Larewa Paka from Aotearoa is joining us today. The opposition leader of the Vanuatu parliament, Honorable Ralph Reganvanu is also joining us via video recording. Oral governor of Papua New Guinea, Honorable Gary Jufa, welcome. Marine scientist and former Minister of Marine Resources, Dr. K. Tapu from Tahiti Nui, and the opposition leader of the Tuvalu Parliament, Honorable Enele Sopoanga. 
While our oceans are the blue heart of our planet, it is under threat from pollution, plastic waste, nuclear waste, nuclear water waste, biodiver biodiversity destruction and overfishing. Effects of climate change, including warming okay. oceans, sea level rise. And ocean acidification continue to disproportionately impact Pacific peoples. Yet, <laughs> yet there are commercial mining companies, mainly from the global north, pushing Pacific governments to sponsor their deep sea mining activities for economic benefits within Pacific exclusive, eco exclusive economic zones and areas beyond national jurisdiction. The Greenpeace 2020 report on DSM exposes this in detail and advocates that in order to protect the ocean, the deep ocean re must remain off limits to the mining industry. Indigenous community groups in the Pacific are, have been adamant that deep sea mining should not go ahead with growing support from renowned conservationists, NGOs, churches, scientific communities and legal experts from the region and globally. Pacific states such as Fiji have announced a moratorium on DSM in our waters, supported by Vanuatu and Hello. 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 in 2019. Our neighbors in the Northern Territory of Australia has issued a permanent ban in their waters and the Maori party of Otero has tabled the legislation to ban seabed mining in theirs. Against this background, calls to protect, restore, and regenerate our oceans grow louder. Industry players like BMW, Volvo, Google, Samsung, as well as fishery bodies are joining this call for moratorium on DSM. We need to protect our oceans now more urgently than ever to protect the long-term lifelines of the Pacific, of the planet. The UN Decade on Science is Ocean science is the opportunity to add to the growing body of scientific knowledge on the potential impacts of DSM on deep sea ecology. So this session today, this webinar today with our distinguished guests will be about an hour and a half long in duration and will feature in a first part, seven to 10 minute interventions from our, seven to 10 minute presentations from our panelists, followed by a, a moderated discussion and question and answer time by Maureen. Just a reminder that this uh, session is recorded. I will be introducing each speaker individually when it's their time to um, present. And first up in order of speaking, we have um, the Honorable, first we'll have, the first speaker will be Honorable Debbie Narewa Paka, followed by the Honorable Reverend, uh, Ralph Regan Banu from Vanuatu, Honorable Gary Jufa from Papua New Guinea, Dr. Ketapu from Tahiti, and then our final speaker will be the Honorable Enele Sopoanga from Tuvalu. Without further ado, let me introduce the first speaker, the Honorable Debbie Narewa Paka. Partier born and bred, she is a member of of the parliament in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and a co-leader for the Maori Party. In March this year, the Honorable Narewa Packer presented her first legislation as a new member of parliament, the Prohibition of Seabed Mining Legislation Amendment Bill. Kia ora, Honorable Debbie, thank you for joining us today. Kia ora, Nā koutou, uh, ngā mihi kia koutou koe tā mai ki te kūru e pāna ki tā tātou. Uh, moana, uh, ka pai ki te kite, ki te rongo, ki a koutou katoa, uh, nō reira, uh, kia ora. I'm not sure if you can see me, I'm not sure where I'm looking at here or there. I'm looking here, straight ahead. Um, so, um, first of all, thank you uh, to the conveners and to everyone that's here attending 
um, to talk about a um, really important kaupapa to us all as uh, Tangata Whenua and Tangata Moana, um, the well-being of our ocean. Uh, I'm just quickly, uh, before becoming an MP uh, as a grassroots activist and um, a uh, iwi um, worker and um, born and bred on the coast in Pātea, which is a village in South Taranaki, um, North Island. So uh, I guess what we've been contending with is, um, if I can just share um, a little part of uh, our mahi, and like most of you, um, our moana is, uh, is our atua is extremely precious to us, precious to, um, we are all made up of water, our wakapapa comes from the water, from the wai, uh, our wairua um, and our kai. So everything for us is about uh, being ocean um, people and, and ocean um, dependent. So uh, if I can, we have been contending uh, with the very first uh, seabed mining um, permit in Aotearoa. And it's a really frightening kaupapa um, because every part of this um, fighting this particular activity is precedent setting in Aotearoa. So uh, we've dealt with uh, select committees, um, we've dealt with local government processes, uh, we've gone through three court cases now, uh, which are Environmental Court, High Court, um, Court of Appeal, and thankfully have won in cases to stop the activity um, of the seabed mining um, trans-Tasman resources. And we currently are waiting for the outcome of the Supreme Court and are really hoping that they're going to continue to uphold the previous court's decisions, which is to um, recognise the devastation that this type of activity will have on our um, moana, on our ocean. Um, part and parcel of, of that also has been pushing into, and part of the reason why I'm in government, or in, in parliament, I'm not in government, I'm in opposition, is to um, push through the significance of uh, where we sit as Indigenous peoples as these um, extractors and these sorts of permits are coming and the importance of having our voices and our pukaro, our thoughts uh, in uh, not only stopping this particular permit but ensuring that this activity is prohibited and halted. So I was, I was very fortunate to um, be supported by our, our community and our iwi and one of the uh, many things that I've been tasked to do is to use that position of influence to actually stop um, anyone else ever having to fight seabed mining in Aotearoa. Um, it's been, uh, they are an extremely large company with bottomless pockets. I'm probably telling you things you're all contending with, with lots of promises of jobs and um, hope for a community like my own, which is high disparity high unemployment, um, highly unskilled. And uh, again, um, thankfully, uh, the, I guess the purpose of me being in, in parliament is to use that influence to push through a member's bill. Um, and I'm really proud to um, be here amongst you all as a co-fighter, um, a co-warrior for the ocean is, um, and to use my position to um, put that member's bill forward um, the Members' Bill uh, is um, drafted uh, um, legislation and effectively it's proposing to um, prohibit seabed mining ever been in Aotearoa and including um, stopping, retrospectively stopping the permit that we've been fighting. And it's very much a um, David and Goliath corridor, um, a David and Goliath fight. But, you know, we are um, a very much voluntary driven. Our iwi has um, small resources. There's a lot of pain and, and fighting and pushback that goes. Um, these large companies have a lot of um, not just political, um, particularly the last government, a lot of political support, but they also have money to put out a really aggressive marketing campaign, which makes us look anti-progress, anti-employment, anti-economic development um, because we're pro-environmental um, mentalists. So uh, my hope is that 
We're lucky um, as Te Pāti Māori, so I'm the co-leader also for Te Pāti Māori, the only Indigenous um, party in Aotearoa, and we have had backing from the Green Party. Yay. Um, we are lobbying um, the government at the moment to get backing. I'm not sure how that's going to land, uh, but certainly uh, our hope is that um, between the activism that we're doing on the ground, the court cases that we are leading off, um, and hopefully the precedent setting to stop this um, abhorrent activity ever coming into our shores or anyone else's, and this member's bill. Uh, the other thing I'd like to share before I um, finish and take any questions, and I'm not sure if I've got the right time, so just give me the wink, is um, part of the other kaupapa that we've been doing is it's very much a community ground up driven um, campaign. So the is a reef program, the South Taranaki Reef um, Group have been, the divers have gone out there and put cameras. And you know, we've, because of um, confiscation and displacement as Indigenous peoples, we actually have lost touch with what our art or our ocean looks like inside and on the bottom, you know, on, on the floor. We've we've been quite displaced. I think in our whole tribe, I know of one person that owns a boat that actually actually goes out fishing on a, on a boat large enough. So um, part of that program has been re-educating our wukapuna and our tamariki at our school. And we've got a really proactive um, South Tanaki reef. So they go out and they're studying the indigenous species, the indigenous reefs, the indigenous life. So when somebody arrives and says to us, look, you know, it's okay, you, you know, and this is effectively what they say, look, it's okay, those notices are jumping up and down about nothing, it's barren, there's nothing there, it's just dead um, ocean bed. We've got all this footage and all these cameras, all these, um, our children in our schools doing um, filming and artwork and creating signage and stuff to actually bring to life a lot of our cordial that we had lost because of our displacement. So I just wanna um, share that from a political, legal, grassroots activism but most importantly the education um, that we take on board we need to do so we never lose touch um, with the significance of the ocean. Mm. Thank you Honourable Debbie and thank you for your leadership in this David and Goliath fight and uh, proposing that bill to ban uh, seabed mining. Could I Hello. just prompt just, um, just one question before we get to uh, the next speaker. Um, if you know the process that you are going through is of interest to us observing from the region and is a further indication of our shared concerns for this explo exploitative industry. What kind of role do you expect New Zealand to play in the region on this controversial issue on seabed mining and deep sea mining? Uh, if I, look, I, I think, sorry, I think the first thing is that it's, it's been really great. It's been commendable that this government has made some big decisions to stop um, new permits and activity. But we are um, certainly as Tangata Whenua, our belief is that, and certainly as um, partners and recipients within uh, Te Tiriti or Waitangi, our belief is that we should be front footing and leading the prohibition of any type of activity like this. Um, convincing those uh, who have quite a, um, a, an aggressive agenda um, for profit um, profiteering is the hardest thing that we have here. Uh, I think it's been a natural affinity for us as Māori. And to be honest, our tangata tariti are, are very supportive of um, protecting our ocean, protecting the integrity of um, Papatunuku and Tangaroa. But the, I think certainly there's not a single uh, tangata whenua that you will meet that will sit there and not say that we don't believe we should be leading off on this and and i think that's certainly the integrity um that our party and that, and that we personally believe in and practice and encourage thank you honorable debbie mm -hmm. moving to our next speaker our next speaker is the opposition leader of vanuatu parliament the honorable ralph Rogan vanu as we in, we in the region recognize the recent developments in Vanuatu Parliament this week, we understand that Honorable Ralph is unable to join us today as planned. However, we pre-recorded a panel interview with him and we will be playing this to you instead. Thank you. Uh, 
I'll hand over to the team to play um, Honorable Ralph's video. Oni, can you just um, move on to the um, next speaker? Sorry, while okay. we just. All right, sorry, apologies for that. Um, just a slight technical glitch, but we will be grabbing his video soon. But in the meantime, let's move to our third speaker. Um, our third speaker today is the governor of Oro Province in Papua New Guinea, Honorable Gary Jufa. He is a political agitator for indigenous peoples. Honorable Jufa is well known in Papua New Guinea and the region for challenging the exploitation of our land and sea resources by very powerful mining and logging companies and the corrupt leaders that enable them. Hello, Honorable Jufa. Are you with us today? Yes, I am. Thank you very much for joining us. Could you share your views on uh, seabed mining and deep sea mining, particularly on Papua New Guinea's experiences and the power of corporations and mining companies that threaten to undermine ocean leadership and our confidence in institutions like the ISA that might that are meant to regulate, but more so importantly, protect the ocean environment from mining harm? So, in Papua New Guinea, in Papua New Guinea, the the idea of seabed mining uh, is obviously a new concept that I would say the greater majority of our people <clears throat> know very little about, and uh, that includes those in parliament, those who have been elected to protect and promote the interests of our country. So, you know, when the idea of seabed mining came about, uh, the a large number of uh, people, especially the coastal communities, were curious. They had no idea how this would impact on their lives. But thanks to a lot of NGOs that went out and about, and I'd like to name a few of them, uh, Soul Warrior Warriors and uh, Act Now, uh, with help from regional NGOs organizations such as PANG, did a significant awareness efforts that um, started to raise you know, the concerns of the coastal communities. And in 2012, uh, this was expressed in a petition presented on the 28th of October to the mining minister at that time, uh, the Honorable Byron Chan uh, at the Holiday Inn Hotel. I was present and about 28,000 signatures were affixed to this particular petition, basically stating that under no circumstances did the people of the coastal communities of Papua New Guinea, especially New Island, uh, supported seabed mining. And the minister at that time undertook to respond within two weeks. He never responded. And he's no longer in parliament, uh, which is probably a testament to, you know, the expression of the people, his voters, etc., who, who are in from that particular area. Now, I myself was in government at that time and uh, had a meeting with the prime minister at that time, the <clears throat> uh, Peter O'Neill, and expressed my concern about seabed mining. And his views were that it was already a done deal. It had been agreed to uh, by the previous government, which was the Somari government, and that the, uh, that the appropriate avenues had already been exhausted in terms of how to deal with this particular matter. And uh, Papua New Guinea was going to participate as a partner, you know, and uh, in fact, we, we lost about $157 million, 300 million Kina thereabouts, because obviously seabed mining never took off. But, but the greater majority of, uh, I would say the greater majority of Papua New Guineans are against seabed mining. Uh, in parliament, it's the same. When I had discussions on, uh, on the subject matter with most of my colleagues in parliament, 
Most of them expressed privately that they were against it and uh, would not support it. But, uh, you know, it had already been bulldozed through and uh, government had even committed some funding, as I mentioned earlier, 300 million, which we've lost. Uh, we still, there are many of us who are still very much against it. The current mm -hmm. prime minister, Marape, he has expressed strong views against it uh, and, and has uh, stated that it is a failed project and it should not be resuscitated. Um, we'll have to verify whether he continues to maintain those views, but I would imagine so that he, he would you know, not be uh, supportive of seabed mining. Uh, and I think this new government, there is a more concern for what the landowners actually think and how they are concerned about seabed mining and how it will affect their livelihoods. So that in a nutshell is where we are. I myself am uh, very hostile to the idea. Uh, I've considered taking the matter to court if, if it progresses. I would like to also table uh, proposals in parliament that would say put a moratorium on seabed mining for a uh, period of time, say maybe 120 years or something like this. So, so, so those are my okay. views and, uh, yeah. you know, I, we're, we're totally against it. Uh, when I say we, I mean those of us who are from the coastal region are totally yeah. against it. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable uh, Gary. If I could get um, maybe a final comment on, um, on the issue or the experience of the global pandemic in the Pacific, if you have a message to the rest of the region, especially for states who are, who are considering DSM as an option for the economic recovery uh, from this pandemic, do you have any views to share on that or messages to the region? Look, I think the unknowns are too great. We do not know enough about the repercussions or ramifications of this activity uh, on our livelihoods, definitely on our seabed. I mean, how it affects the life, the, uh, the, the, the vents and uh, the pelagic area of the oceans. And, you know, they, they're just too many great unknowns. If the developed nations have already said they are not going to consider it because of that fact, then why are they pushing it down the throats of the developing nations? And we should not even consider this. We are an ocean people. This is, we should not interfere with what is a significant part of our lives. The, the ocean is our life and there is absolutely no way we should even consider doing anything that can disturb this, this, this huge part of our life. I mean, it's madness to consider it. That's, that's basically what I would say. We should all band together and just say, let's stop this madness and let's not allow it not just for us as a Pacific people, but the whole world. I mean, you're not going to go to another planet. I don't think Elon Musk's efforts are going to, you know, uh, bring us the solutions we need immediately. You know, there, there's we're some, some serious period of time away from that. Kanakan, thank you, Honorable um, Gary, for those comments. Looking forward to furthering the discussion in the question and answer thank time with Maureen. Thank you. Thank you, thanks. I will just check in with the uh, team if we are ready for. Um, we will continue with our next speaker, who is the Honorable Minister, uh, op Leader of Opposition from Vanuatu. Thank you, Joey. Could you please share the re recording? Joey, we are unable to hear the audio, please. You know that Vanuatu has always been considered a trailblazer in the region and leader on hard issues in the Pacific. Fast forward to 2020. Greetings, Honorable Regan Vanu. Thank you for joining us today. 
Um, welcome to this discussion, regional discussion on um, the issue of DSM. Um, leader, you know that Vanuatu has always been considered a trailblazer in the region and leader on hard issues in the Pacific. Fast forward to 2021, and the, in, the increase in sciences are clear on the negative impacts of DSM. It's irreversible harm to our ecosystems. It's impacts on the carbon sequestering functions of oceans. The impacts on livelihoods for Pacific communities and the real threat to economic lifelines for our Pacific people. Where do you stand on the issue of DSM? And what's next for Vanuatu in imposing a, DS, a ban on DSM? Well, greetings to everybody watching this, um, this webinar. I'm very pleased to be able to have a pre-recorded slot on it. I'm, I apologize for not being able to join you today. We are currently in a bit of a political crisis in Vanuatu and we have to be in parliament today. So um, unfortunately I can't join you in person live, but um, thank you for the opportunity to be part of this uh, by way of this pre-recorded um, segment. So yes, in, in Vanuatu, we really started talking about deep sea mining. Back in uh, 2014, uh, I had just become the Minister of Lands and Natural Resources responsible for um, mining. And in preparing for a SPC uh, workshop on deep sea mining, it was a part of the SPC's work with the European Union on um, preparing the region for a discussion about you know, policies and approaches to deep sea mining. Uh, I found out when, when we were being asked to host the meeting and we were approaching the meeting and I was uh, trying to find out what the situation was in Vanuatu, that was when I discovered that uh, about 154 licenses had been issued for prospecting on the seabed not only for minerals, but also oil and gas, of course. But this was, of course, news to me as a you know, second term member of parliament. Uh, the general public had no idea. And so this brought us back to a discussion about how, do, how does government deal with these issues without anybody knowing about it? And one of the first things we then did was to embark on a national consultation to talk to people about this, you know, what is deep sea mining? What is this idea of, you know, going out in the ocean offshore in down at the bottom of the sea and looking for minerals that are there and the possibility of using them for economic development or so on. So the very concept was alien to New Vanuatu people. Just, you had to, you had to go and explain it. Like what, it was sort of inconceivable. Um, and what we found was, uh, at the end, we went through a long process of consultation through the six provinces of Vanuatu. Uh, we ended up coming back to national consultations uh, led by the National Council of Chiefs. And basically, there was a very uh, unbelieving, but also uh, people were very, uh, they just, they, they, they sort of couldn't believe in a way we were talking about this sort of stuff and a very strong resistance to anything going ahead or the government be pushing anything forward. And that was where we left it in terms of that that is the current position of the, of the government is that we're not going to push anything because the people just, don't, just don't have no appetite at all. Since then, and with the awareness of deep sea mining, we've had many uh, further awareness raising by um, civil society organizations, peak national organizations. And when it came to the, the recent um, Blue Line petition that has just been you know, published and uh, we've, had, we've seen a lot of uh, take up of it. Basically in Vanuatu, we have about 20 organizations who've signed that petition. And that includes the peak organizations representing the chiefs, 
the National Council of Chiefs, Malwa Tamari, has signed on to that petition. The peak organization representing women in the country, the Vanuatu National Council of Women. And in fact, the National Council of Women was the organization that came out in 2014 calling for just an outright ban immediately. And so they've signed on to it as well. The peak organization representing civil society, the VANGO, Vanuatu Association of Non-Government Organizations, the peak uh, organization representing youth, the Vanuatu National Youth Council, um, the peak organization representing churches, the Vanuatu Christian Council. So all the peak organizations representing the main pillars in every, in every community of Vanuatu, which is the chiefs, the church, the women, the youth, uh, have all come out saying we support an outright ban. And this is a result of consultation and awareness. So people are aware of the issues. They've uh, had time to consider them over the years, and this is the position. And that, so as a member of parliament representing the views of the people, I'm now pushing for a ban as well. And I'm actually working with, uh, just uh, recently with uh, a professor, uh, Morrison Moses at the, uh, he's the assistant coordinator of the USP School of Law, a Nivanamatu citizen, and, and, and some of his students to work on what are the legislative, um, what is the legislative tool we need to effect a ban now and into the future. And so basically, I think in terms of policy making, we've, we've done the consultation, the awareness. It's very clear where the people stand on this issue, which is an outright ban. And now we need to find the legislative tool we need to make it happen. And um, interestingly, it's very much in line with our stated national development goals. We have a uh, Vanuatu National Sustainable Development Plan, also called the People's Plan 2030. And it's our sustainable development plan for 2016 to 2030, uh, in line with the United Nations um, Sustainable Development Goals. And it's very clear our, one of our uh, main objectives the development aspirations, there are uh, five of them. And one of them is, and I'll, and I'll quote what it says, maintaining a pristine natural environment on land and at sea that serves our food, cultural, economic, and ecological needs. So maintaining a pristine natural environment on land and at sea is one of our five national aspirations in our national development plan now until 2030. And that plan, of course, was done in the same way with lots of consultation. Uh, one of the first development plans developed in the country with uh, widespread uh, consultation, which is why we call it the People's Plan. And uh, as national leaders, as a member of parliament, I'm currently leader of the opposition, um, we will now be working on uh, the legislative tools, uh, the legislation that we need to implement that ban. And it's, uh, and there's, there's many grounds for it. Uh, there's, there's many reasons why we should not even consider deep sea mining in the Pacific. Uh, and, and I think many other speakers will cover that. But for me, as a, a leader and as an elected member of parliament, the main reason for me is that the people have very clearly said, after awareness raising and consultation, that we do not want deep sea mining in Vanuatu. And that's our position. Can I call uh, Honourable Regan Van? Um, just a final question: If you, what what advice or message do you have for our Pacific governments in following a similar line, or um, in encouraging um, them to consult their their people on DSM, and also to develop a legislative space to protect our oceans against these threats? Any final messages on that to our Pacific leaders? I think um, in, in the Pacific, you know, we're all indigenous people. You know, we're, we're, we're the area of the world where the largest proportion of indigenous populations are within the national populations of the sense. And so we need to take that long view. We've been in the Pacific for thousands of years. Um, our current states, are, you know, the maximum, the oldest one is probably some other 50 years old. And we have some very young states. We have emerging states still. We're a very young uh, area of the world in terms of uh, nation states, governments, policy making, decision making. But in terms of people living 
in, the, in an ocean, oceanic environment. We have been here for thousands of years and we're not going anywhere. Uh, we will continue to be here. We are leading the world in ocean policy issues in terms of climate change. We are, the, we are some of the main advocates for climate change. We are some of the main advocates against nuclear testing. Uh, we are advocating very strongly now with uh, against the release of uh, radioactive water from Fukushima. Um, in terms of oceans, we are also leaders. Uh, it's very important for our leaders to take that long view and also to consider that uh, we have we are very, we're a young region with uh, young people who need to be provided the same opportunities we were given and, and hopefully more. And our opportunities come from our, our environment as well as ourselves as, human, as humans within that environment. In terms of developing these tools, I think consultation is always, it's, it's something we always do in Vanuatu. We try to make sure that we have an extensive consultation with the peak organizations representing different sectors of the society, come up with a, a view which we can then put into an action. And I think uh, I, I would invite others to learn from our experience. And we definitely will be looking at the, uh, the way the legislation that was used in the Northern Territory of Australia to ban deep sea mining, also the legislation that's being proposed by the Maori Party. Uh, and we, I think it's important we share those experiences and come up with a framework where we can then get these things passed in our own countries, but also on a regional level with the Pacific Islands Forum, other regional crop agencies, get a regional approach that it feeds into a global approach that needs to happen in the long run. Isa, thank you and welcome back everybody. Um, just apologies for the glitches that we're facing and we trust for your understanding in this time. We will now move to our two final speakers. Um, our next speaker is from Tahiti Nui. Dr. K. Tapu is a researcher and professor in, o sorry, Dr. K. Tapu is a researcher and professor in ocean, oceanography, marine biodiversity, atmospheric, and geophysics. He holds a doctorate in oceanography from the University of Toulouse. Dr. K. Tapu was, has previously taught at the French University of the Pacific, also at the University of the South Pacific, and the University of French Polynesia. He was the Minister of Marine Resources and Research under the Temau government in 2004 to 2008. Currently, Dr. Ketapu is serving as a member of the town council of Taiyarapu East in Tahiti. Iorana, and thank you for joining us today, Dr. Ketapu. Iorana, can you hear me? Because we did not make any test. <laughs> Dr. Ketapu, we can hear you. All right. Hello, Hello Ketapu. Yeah. Could you, could you, I have two questions for you today, but my first question is, could you share with us the talk and views of DSM that is happening in French Polynesia? And what is at stake for the fishing sector, other marine biodiversity and coastal communities, including tourism? And how can our leaders and, institu and institutions center Pacific fisheries and marine biodiversity in this debate on whether to mine the oceans. Yeah, thank you, uh, Yaran Abula. Um, yeah, a lot of questions there, <laughs> but uh, I'm not sure I will cover all of them, but uh, I'll try my best. But I'd like to start first from the deep sea mining. So, because uh, yeah, our situation is a bit different from most of the country, make, but quite similar to Maori in New Zealand because we're still a colony. And uh, even though we are being granted uh, autonomy, but it's not full autonomy, we don't have the right to negotiate anything with any countries in terms of direct exchange of money. For example, we don't have the control of the money. So, man, just I like to give some facts. So, because 
the, listening to the previous um, panelists, uh, I can understand that most of our people are lost because we don't often don't know the extent of our ocean, how big it is and how precious it is for us because, uh, you know, as a colon, colon, colony of France, you know, in the past, French people used to say, I mean, the French, not people, the government, this is the noise they were making, that we cost a lot to them. But today we don't hear about this thing anymore. And France is now proud to be the first the first is proud to have is proud to have the biggest EEZ in the world, about 11 million square kilometer. But half of that EEZ is in French Polynesia. It's enormous. So it's will be we can understand, you can understand now that France will not give us up. So and on top of that, we have in the deep ocean, we have minerals, you know, and rocks. Uh, 2,000 meters, for example, we, it's possible. We have rocks where uh, full of platinum because it's the highest concentration in platinum in the world, and manganese. And we have all the mud because of the, the, at the bottom of the ocean, the, all the mud that contains the rare earth. It's no use for lights or phosphor like this. Of course, we do not have the mean the power to exploit those uh, those uh, minerals, but uh, even France actually, because France is, uh, we can't do it first in our, on our own because we are not the owner. We're not owning that land, that, that soil. This is owned by France and it's classified by France like a strategic matter. So the owner of this, anything underground, anything even on land, belongs to France, not to the French Polynesian government. We're not owner of anything. But coming to the exploitation of it, even France itself is unable to exploit this because they already went around to prospect for some other companies from Australia, Can Canada, South Africa, to exploit the, the mud that's in the deep ocean. But we all know that will not be, it will not be to the benefit of the people, of the local people, because this is not the first time. I think like most of the islands of the, or countries of the South Pacific, you know, there was an exploitation of a mineral somewhere. Like it has happened in Tahiti for 60 years, in 1900 to 1960. Uh, we have uh, phosphate in Makatea and uh, an island in the Tuamotu where it which has been exploited by a French company of phosphate, but nothing's left to the people. So only holes left on the island and pollution, of course, of the env environment because all the infrastructure was just left as it is. So, so there's no benefit for the people. And in terms of pollution, I think it's important. I, I think everywhere where there has been mining. I mean, I think of PNG, Solomon, and then they use a lot of acid to extract the, 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 uh, the metal from it. So, you no, know, the process is acid leaching. And so it's very, I mean, I think PNG people know about it, detrimental to the environment, detrimental to the water table, because they will suffer, all the rivers are polluted and it goes to the sea. This is on the land. What will happen if we go deep in the ocean? So if we go deep in the ocean, we have to go, go and pump that mud up. There's a leak, it will pollute the whole coral reef. It is close to the coral reef. So all the, the fishes around and all the corals will die. So the acid, what will they do with it? It will stay in the sea. So they won't bring it back. We all know the, the, how they deal with that, those big companies. And for us, it's very no, no benefit at all. So if you see, then I always see the South Pacific as a, I mean, I used to, to have a joke with my friends. I mean, saying that uh, we are the last Africa. I mean, the last place on earth to be exploited in terms of fishing. 
in terms of mining, uh, in terms of everything. So we are becoming the central part of the world in terms of economy, but we're not part of it. We will never be part of it because we don't have the mean, we don't have, we are not helped by these big countries coming. I mean, we, we are still, even for those who are countries who are independent, I just heard, I mean, the, the oldest one among us is, is Samoa. And then, uh, but we're still under the influence of the, our colonizers. So it's, it would be very difficult for us. If you want man, to summarize this on a long term, my view, uh, it would be wiser not to go there if it's for their benefit. Because we've been lived, we lived here for years and thousands of years without these things. And we are not that numerous. And also the uh, exploitation of that. That's a big question, yes or no? Because uh, we are, I have to say our leaders, our leaders are very weak when it comes to talk about economy because we always think of economy in terms of money. And so this is, is the cash. So, and we have to work because, and often like uh, the previous uh, panelists said, the public is ignorant, ignorant about what happened. It's fast cash coming in, but short term live, short term life. So in our actual situation, we are not educated enough. We need to form a new generation in order, if we want to do it, that stays in our country, that stays for us, because they earn a lot more than what's given to the country, a lot more. So we are losing, and in, in if we go in, uh, in straight exportation now, we have been in Asia, we've been fighting with France. No, since 2013, we have been put back on the, uh, and listed again on the UN uh, list of uh, country to be decolonized. And uh, we've been uh, reporting every time to UN about this, the fact that we're not owning our land. Uh, no, I mean, we're not own, owning the soil I mean, the, the underground is not ours. So it's in the UN, but we never know here what France will do. We're not aware of anything, neither our own government. So nobody knows because like I said, this is strategic matter for France. And so they don't have to report to us. They can decide, decide alone. So it's terrible. So they, there is a, a long-term impact will be bad for the, our future generation because pollution on the sea is difficult. Because if everybody, if we take our all whole EEZ of the all the islands, which represents something like about 30,000 square kilometers, it's the biggest one on the on earth. It's the biggest one. If we take all that and all the small islands I exploit, they go to deep sea mining, will the whole ocean will be brown. So everything will die. Thank you, Dr. Ketaku, for, for sharing with us and reminding us of the the presence of um, our enduring colonialism powers in, in the region and reminding us to be aware of um, the external actors that that limit us and exploit us um, and our interests. Mm -hmm. We look forward to extending this conversation in the uh, discussion time following our final speaker. So please stay on the line. Um, I move now to our final speaker for today um, in his presentation. Um, it is our renowned, he is our renowned regional climate champion, the Honorable Enele Sopoanga. He is currently the opposition leader of the Tuvalu Parliament and former Prime Minister of Tuvalu. Today he speaks to us as a climate justice leader that we all know him to be and recognize his leadership in steering the region and the world towards climate justice action. 
Today, he shares with us on how deep sea mining would affect our climate and oceans. Talofa, Honorable Anale, are you with us? Can you hear me? Honorable Anale, you are on mute. If you could un unmute your... How's that? I can hear you, Honorable uh, and. Analyst. Are you receiving, hearing me now? Yes, I can hear you clearly. All right. So, okay. my, if, so my, my question mm. to you today has to do with um, how we are noticing climate justice, how the climate justice narrative is being co-opted and used by mining companies to justify and rush justify the rush towards mining our ocean floors for precious metals. How do we in the Pacific talk seriously about the contradictions in our, our standings as moral champions on one hand of climate justice and on the other hand, we are becoming one of the largest sponsors of environmental destruction through DSM activities and licensing in our waters. Honorable Enele, you have the floor. Uh, no, uh, no, I appreciate the opportunity to speak, to uh, offer some views. But uh, to your specific question, I, I, I do see there is no connection whatsoever uh, for the need to exploit the uh, ocean floor, the seabed, uh, uh, for seabed mining. Uh, uh, to address things that would create, you know, create more problems, more environmental problems for the small island countries like Tuvalu and those in the Pacific. I think we really need to, uh, to focus on what we have uh, agreed conventionally, uh, particularly uh, through the Paris Agreement on climate change. And, uh, and you know, as you know, uh, people know, of course, the, the, the issue of oceans, whilst, uh, re, you know, touched there in the Paris Agreement, really needs to be uh, admitted into, uh, incorporated into the, the Paris Agreement for proper actions. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and one of those seri uh, actions, important uh, one, is to make sure we do not allow um, seabed mining uh, simply uh, be misled by the excuse to get minerals for energy, renewable uh, energy and that sort of thing, or energy sources. I think we really need to keep it there. As we have already uh, uh, spoken many times in the Pacific Island Leaders Forum, in the context of that, uh, uh, that process, we have committed ourselves uh, by leaders to uh, make sure we protect and save our oceans. And this goal has uh, political uh, ramifications and meaning as well. Um, if, if you can recall, we, we uh, started way back in dealing with issues that uh, affect the protections and, and the saving of our oceans, whilst uh, uh, mainly focusing on fisheries. We, we have been dealing with the issues of avoiding seabed mining in the Pacific region, particularly in our national EEZ. And, and I think our uh, uh, individual legislation uh, in countries have highlighted the need to protect that and to continue to synchronize and perhaps integrate uh, better into the political uh, uh, arena. We, if you recall in our, in our Samoa uh, Pacific Island Leaders uh, Forum, I think it was 1917, um, we committed to a Annele, are you able to hear me? I think we might have lost him. Uh, let's give him a minute to rejoin us. Oh, 
Honorable Annele. We'll, we'll just do a quick check with the Honourable um, Emily to see if he's online. We've just he's just lost connection, so we'll get him to rejoin us uh, in the this question and answer uh, open open session, um, and he can continue his contribution with uh, Maureen and the rest of the panelists. Thank you to all our panelists for their brief presentation, and we look forward to deepening this conversation with Maureen. Um, in and the rest of our audience um, in the following uh, sec part of this segment. Um, it's been an honor to co-host this with Maureen and now I hand over to Maureen to take us through to the rest of the, the call. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marioni. And if I could just ask if our esteemed panelists could just all turn your uh, cameras back on so we can see you. Um, there's a couple of questions that have come up, but I'd just like to open up to all of our attendees uh, that have joined us. Um, please do raise your hands. We've got uh, another 20 so minutes. Um, so I would just probably take three questions. Um, if I call your name out, please do ask your question. Uh, introduce yourself, keep your question short. Uh, but there's this already quite a few. So I think Tess Newton, you're up first. Can you hear me, Tess? Um, team, can you unmute uh, to enable? Yeah, I'm unmuted now, Maureen. Thanks, Tess. Okay, Please. thank you. And thank you for convening this conversation and to everyone that's contributed. Um, I guess my my question sort of is around this idea of how national conversations interact with regional conversations. Um, in Tuvalu in 2019, Fiji raised the idea of a, a regional moratorium on deep sea mining for a 10 year period. Um, that wasn't taken forward at that stage. A number of things have changed since then. Um, but, uh, you know, given, given what we know about differing positions across the region, you know, I'm thinking of countries like Cook Islands and Nauru, who seem to be wanting to go down this track of moving towards engaging in deep sea mining. Do, what's the likelihood of that regional position being able to be arrived at and I guess does it matter or is it is it more appropriate that people like uh, Honourable Gary Juffer and Honourable Ralph Regan Varnu focus on getting uh, those sorts of moratoriums in place at the national level? Any of our panellists would like to take that question? Gary? I'll have to ask Tess to just, can, can she just repeat that question again? My apologies. I, I no. didn't hear the last bit. Sorry, just, I guess it's just a case of, you know, given that we know this anti deep sea mining or these concerns about deep sea mining are not shared across the whole of the membership of the Pacific Islands Forum, is trying to get a regional position on this, a regional moratorium, a good use of energy? Or is it more appropriate that the countries who are concerned about it, such as you say, it's not welcomed in Papua New Guinea, um, it's not welcomed in Vanuatu, is it more important that, that uh, policymakers work at the national level to get moratoriums in place? Okay, um, I, these are just my thoughts, of course, but I think the right thing to do would be to look at what Vanuatu has done you know, and consult our people, consult our people extensively. First, do awareness, 
on the pros and cons and you know consult our people and then once we have consulted our people basically take their views to parliament and translate those views into legislation appropriate legislation and if we did that i i'm 90 percent convinced that the greater majority of our pacific peoples would be very hostile to the idea of deep sea mining you know uh what's happening as uh, one of the speakers uh mentioned in parliaments in, 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 in the Pacific is that most parliamentarians are quite meek when it comes to stepping up and standing up against the, you know, the, the, the modern forms of colonialism that are taking place, which giant transnational corporations are basically exercising in, in the Pacific. You know, they come in here and they basically throw money around and uh, convince parliamentarians to agree with them, you know? And sometimes their efforts are even more sinister because they, they fund and finance uh, not just individual members of parliament, but entire parties and they own them, you know? So, you know, we've got to understand that many of our parliaments are filled not just with elected leaders who represent their peoples, but also pets owned by transnational corporations. You know, and what I would like to see, and maybe it's it, it's a bit naive, but we should all agree that we all as nations ought to do what Vanuatu has done: consult our people, and then take their views to our parliament and translate it into appropriate legislation. That may be too difficult as a region; however, we can all do it as 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 countries. You know, uh, Vanuatu's done that, or is leading the way in that regards. New Zealand is uh, attempting to do that. Parts of Australia have done that. Uh, and, you know, if we were to, you know, really do a thorough effort and consult the peoples of the Pacific, as I've said earlier, I'm, I'm sure that 90% plus, 99% would, would just say, look, let's, let's not even consider this stupid idea, you know. Thanks, Gary. Uh, did anyone want else want to? Because I can see there's quite a few key questions. Kate Tapu, if you want to. I mean, the ocean does not recognize, you know, these kinds of artificial jurisdictional boundaries that, you know, we talk about sovereign states, but in the case of deep sea mining and its impact, it does not recognize that. So I think Tessa's question is quite pertinent. Do we uh, do the long road, start within our EZs? Yeah. But our EZs is, is yeah. still. It's, uh, yeah, I agree with Gary, but uh, this is a nice answer. It would be great if we can counsel people. But unfortunately, decisions are taken even by, by government without consulting people because they have the agreement we don't, we don't need us to say what kind of agreement. So we all know about this kind of agreement because they want sort of develop the economy in our area and so on. This has happened recently here, but unfortunately the things, because they wanted, it's an Australian company who wanted to come and exploit again Makatea in uh, French Polynesia. So in Tahiti Nui and, and the, Fortunately, it didn't work because there are some people stood up and didn't agree to people living on the island. So it's, if, if there is a consultation of people, I think the, the people would be worried and would be aware of what will happen on the long term and in the short term and so on. And uh, that's very important informing our people. And those things never happen when it comes to those decisions. It stays at the governmental level. So, and government, government, a government company, and nobody else knows about it. In our case, it's even worse because France can intervene and decide to do it alone. So we have no say in that. So, but it's true, I mean, in terms of EZ, it's something that has been imposed to us by those big countries. I always told that, I always say that because it's a, what's a, a fictive line between two countries but uh, if one exploit go and de do with deep sea mining some area i mean it might benefit him in terms of money but the pollution might benefit and will go everywhere 
So the, the whole, the current newcomer will start with. Thanks. Can I uh, perhaps ask Phil uh, and if both Phil and uh, Alfred, if you could just ask two questions, but keep them again, if you can introduce yourselves, keep your questions really short and who you're directing your questions to. And then we'll probably take one additional round after this of questions. Phil and then uh, Alfred. Really thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, Maureen. And, and it's been really good and, and an honor to hear from each of you uh, on your views on the issue and, and what's being done in national waters. And give, but given the international seabed authorities rapidly advancing the regulations to open international waters to deep sea mining, particularly in the North Pacific between Hawaii uh, and, and Mexico. Um, and, and one company, Deep Green, who's sponsored by Nauru, Kiribati and, and Tonga, says it wants to start mining commercially in 2024. Um, firstly, is this, it's extending it out beyond a, a regional sort of uh, conversation, but at an international level, is this of concern to each of you? And, and what do you think it would take for your countries to support a, a moratorium in international waters? Thank you. I guess I guess directing at that at maybe Debbie and 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 um, and Honourable uh, NLA and and um, Gary perhaps. Thank you. Alfred, would you like to ask your question at this stage? Well, yes. the... and uh, Bula, everyone, this is Alfred from uh, WWF Pacific, and I'm just uh, I believe on what Phil had just mentioned. Um, um, there's a lot of information, um, scientific papers that have come out since 2019 in Tuvalu when the when Pacific Island leaders met. And I think this is an opportune time to ask for us to consider how we can take national uh, sessions to the regional level. Maybe it's about time to, uh, for us to reassess um, our current uh, advocacy uh, and as a collective group uh, whose uh, countries who are um, uh, supporting the moratorium could then based on new information that has come up to be able to present uh, back to the uh, to the collective uh, Pacific Island Forum leaders and see what uh, if we are able to convince the rest of the Pacific Island countries to join uh, the support for a moratorium. That's just and I think this goes to all the panelists on what are their thoughts with regards to that. Would like yeah. to start uh, responding? Yeah, can I uh, from Tuvalu? Uh, NLA. Thank you, NLA. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I the the machine cut me off uh, while I was uh, raising the issue of uh, unique vulnerabilities of uh, island countries in the Pacific. These vulnerabilities uh, uh, can can be uh, uh, can present serious situations for island countries. We know. Uh, there is a, a special hunger now yeah. for money, hunger for income, for revenue. And this is uh, prevailing in, uh, especially in government's level, where uh, governments are entering into uh, the possibility of passport schemes, uh, you know, uh, selling passports, national sovereignties, um, you know, trying to uh, uh, to make profits out of national, of sovereignty assets. And we hear around, including my own uh, country, Tuvalu, people are talking about uh, uh, selling uh, passports to foreigners uh, as a way of making income, of revenue, of making money. Not only that, it's all also talking about Bitcoin, uh, all sorts of funny um, businesses that, that, that they, they think uh, can be good uh, sources of revenue. Now, in that context, uh, and against that such a background, we can already see seabed mining as possible, a good candidate for, uh, you know, to be uh, a sellout for island countries without due consideration of the environmental uh, problems, the pollution issues, the split uh, plumes problems that may affect all the livelihood in the oceans, fisheries of the Pacific Island countries. Disregarding, of course, what the Pacific Island leaders have uh, committed to during the Pacific, the Blue Pacific uh, 
conversation in Samoa, Nauru, and in Tuvalu. Uh, I think we, it is really important for us to go back to the Pacific Island Leaders uh, uh, Forum for the Pacific Forum leaders to make a commitment to towards working uh, towards a total ban of seabed mining in the Pacific region, but perhaps also take it up to the global level. We need to connect with the United Arms Clause as well. And Isa, you know, in the United Nations, a special advisor to the United Nations Secretary General um, is, is our own son, um, Ambassador uh, Thompson of Fiji. We need to communicate and take the message of the Pacific Island leaders uh, to him, through him, to go up to the UN to make sure the UNCLOS, um, you, you know, safeguards the rights and the protection of uh, livelihood in the Pacific Island countries, not only as a means, not a means of getting, getting economic benefits for a few, for so few people. And we really need to, to coordinate uh, all to, and work collectively and take our voice there. Our Pacific Ocean Commissioner has to do a work to communicate with Ambassador Thompson. And we now have a new Secretary General um, the Prime Minister uh, Henry Puna of Cook Islands. I think he's well aware he's got practical experience there in Cook Islands. And we need to really encourage the forum to take up this task uh, for, you know, to make sure that we protect the oceans of the Pacific Island countries and the region um, away from the, the, these proposals for deep sea mining to come to the Pacific. My, 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 my view is that if we continue to work collectively and take our message to the uh, United Nations, ISA, the International Seabed Authority, we could have some uh, friendly, favorable ears to listen to our plea. These have to uh, go together with our concerns with, with climate change, of course, and sea level rise affecting our island countries. I think we really need to build on and, uh, and make sure we, we, we push forward with our agenda to protect our oceans. I totally agree with the ideas of uh, uh, consultations with people on the grounds, with island communities, NGOs. They need to be uh, informed of the very serious uh, problems of seabed mining. Money is money but it will take away our sovereignty. And if we are not careful, we will have no islands left to enjoy our livelihoods on. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Honorable Enele. Um, we have five minutes and I can, I can see that, you know, the discussions are really starting to pick up. Uh, <clears throat> but I think to be quite uh, respectful to the members of parliament that have given up their time and our panelists, I will take one question and then I'm going to go for one last round uh, with all of our panelists uh, before I sum up and close the session. And if I can just ask Dr. Claire Slatter um, for her question, uh, please Claire, do keep it short and uh, the floor is yours. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. I was going to say I'm happy to give it up to somebody else who's, um, you know, un unlikely to get an opportunity to, to discuss this. Is that, um, or to ask a I've question? Been yeah. Can I then, uh, I, yeah, let me forego my, my um, yeah, speaking to, thank to you. Robert. Yeah. Robert, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Maureen. I'm Robert um, with Otago University in uh, New Zealand. Uh, I'm a PhD student writing a paper on climate change. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, um, uh, um, I think um, our honorable member for, uh, from Tuvalu rightly stated that, um, said something on you know, policies and resolutions. I'm just wondering, um, I want to ask, do we, the Pacific Island, our regional organizations like Pacific Islands Forum, the Melanesian Spearhead Group and the Micronesian one and the Polynesian one, do we have um, resolutions there? 
regarding deep, deep, deep sea bed mining. Have they, do, do, have they, are there positions, they made positions? Yeah. Just, yeah. May yeah, I ask yeah, that? Uh, yeah. yeah, so I, I do recall the, the PLG, the Polynesian Leaders Group that met in Tuvalu uh, 2018, made a strong call in its uh, outcome document, the uh, Amatuku Declaration, to call for a total ban on seabed uh, mining in the Pacific. And this uh, statement by the Pacific Polynesian Leaders Group was endorsed and taken on board um, by the Pacific Island Leaders Forum a year later in 2019. I am sure other um, sub-regional groups, the Micronesian grouping, Melanesian groupings, might have also have had uh, uh, strong statements uh, with the same sort of uh, spirit in their declarations. But the PLG, yes, indeed. Thank you, Anela. Can I ask Gary, because I know he wanted to respond. Gary, um, please go ahead. Um, from what I know with the regional organizations, um, you know, they, they engage in a lot of talk fests, to be honest. And uh, I'm not sure if any of them have had, ever taken a real firm position, you know, on seabed mining. Uh, the Polynesian uh, leaders group would probably be the group that would probably be the most uh, vocal, I, I would say. Uh, Melanesian spearhead group, I've asked for that organization to be disbanded. It's a, it's a, it serves no purpose, in my personal opinion. I'm not aware of the Micronesian who represents the Micronesian peoples, but I think the way to go would be if these organizations actually came out together representing their people and say, hey, look, all of us collectively believe that this is just not a good idea. That would really you know, be a statement for the rest of the world because uh, that, this grouping commands one fifth of the world's surface area. If you think about it, you know, that's a significant grouping. Uh, to, to get out in the communities and consult all our peoples is going to take some time, you know? And we know that when that happens, the, the transnational corporations that have a lot of money to spend will be out and about doing their part and they will have a, they'll be way ahead of the game in this regards, you know? But uh, the group, regional groups to come together and have an effective voice and say something significant about or against seabed mining, I, I think that would be the way to go. But you know, is this a real um, possibility or is it a very you know unreal concept? Given that we tend to uh, meet a lot and have this talk fest and say nothing really much. Thank you, Gary. Uh, with those words, can I ask all of our panelists um, to wrap up in one minute? Uh, what is your vision going forward here? Do you think there is enough energy to build uh, from our EZs, as uh, Ralph Regenvanu correctly points out, that we start within our country's jurisdictions, we go to the regional level, and then to the global platform with a strong message. But any final words, one minute each, please. And if I could ask Debbie uh, for your final thoughts uh, and advice. Order. Um, I think, first of all, I think it's really important that uh, as brothers and sisters, uh, as um, those with Wakapapa too, our moana, as uh, tangata moana, that um, unity is what is needed um, to be able to take on um, the scale to have real impact to um, stop seabed mining. So if I was to say anything um, was that um, we are here in any way or form um, to share and grow our experience. And I think that um, unity to call on um, every other Indigenous brother and sister and to bring um, to rise this kaupapa is one that I would continuously support and encourage. Uh, it is on us as the indigenous peoples of this planet and, and um, 
to carry everything. And we know, we know that it's in our waka papa, it's always been. So I, I think that um, I te ahuatanga o tā tātou tūpuno, the spirit of our ancestors um, that have brought us all here together, um, that that is uh, the unity. I will say, everywhere we go, um, and we have thousands following our platform between the co-leader and I and Te Pāti Māori, um, we've got something like 50, 60,000 following us. The young are dying to, you know, to lead and to be encouraged um, to tow talk all. Uh, so I, I, I think unity and particularly calling on a lot of our young ones um, to lead the way is important. Thank you so much, Debbie. Gary, your one minute. Thank you, uh, everyone here, for your comment, your thoughts, and thank you for the organizers and those who work behind the scenes to make this uh, forum a for this, this discussion a possibility. Uh, I endorse everything Debbie has said, and I just want to add that now more than ever, we need to connect and cooperate, you know, not just in the Pacific, but with the rest of the world. If you look at what is happening in the world, it is, it is, it is very important that the indigenous people of this world come together and connect with not just NGOs and governments, but also corporate entities that are responsible and, and say, look, we have issues that if we do not address, well, there will be no future. Even those organizations that are driven only purely by greed must sit up and take notice because, well, they won't have a future to make profits in, you know, the way we're moving, the way we're going, you know? And that's, I think, a message that we need to start uh, discussing, talking about, and doing more of, more than ever. I mean, if nature has been raising red flags and ringing alarm bells, COVID-19 is probably the largest, the, the loudest, I would say. And we can empathize now with Earth, you know, because we have been to Earth what COVID-19 is to us, really. And we've got to take notice of this. We've got to hear those alarm bells ringing and see those red flags and act and do something about the future because if we don't do anything about it there won't be a future you know this is the only home we know of in 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 this universe in this galaxy you know wherever else that we can dare to look there's nothing else like this this is it this is home thank you dr ketapu Yes, first of all, I'd I like to thank you for inviting me on this uh, webinar as well. And then thank you to, for the, to the organizers. Yeah, I completely agree with, the, with Gary and Debbie when uh, I joined them in this idea. It's only unity if you want to win. And uh, because we are just one ocean, we are all from the same ocean. It's where we all going and having bathing in the same ocean we only need one one to start and that'll be the mass and then that'll be the pollution and that'll be destruction for our future for future generation thank you and final words to nla are you still online with us well yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I do endorse uh, what others have uh, spoken, panelists, but I often say this in the uh, context of climate change. We are all on one, on the same canoe. We need to yeah. keep that canoe afloat. We cannot allow ourselves to be tempted by money in order to sink into the bottom of the ocean of the world. Keep the Michi minerals of the oceans down there, because we need to save and protect the people of the oceans. Malo Faftai, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you everyone. And that brings us to the end of this webinar series. My real gratitude on behalf of the Drawing the Blue Line uh, series team, uh, Dawn, the Pacific Conference of Churches, Pacific Islands Associations of NGOs, Piango, Pang, Toucan, WWF Pacific, uh, supported by our partners, Phil, 
uh, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, Veld in Vanuatu, uh, the Sawara Alliance in Papua New Guinea. Uh, thank you all for joining. I think the, the most resounding words coming across is the need to be wise, the need for unity, the need to really take on what is a David and Goliath battle, but our people are there. And so I think hearing from all of you, our political leaders, at such a critical time to hear your words of wisdom, where you want to go, I think that gives assurances to the movements, the people who have been saying since 2010, 11, 12, 30, this cannot take place in our Salwara, Moana, in our ocean. So I really, really just thank you all for your time. I think it also just suggests that I, the need for further conversations with parliamentarians, members of political parties, members of parliaments is quite critical. So I think as the co -con the convenience of this webinar, we will be looking to host another one, really to start to deep dive further into a lot of these things. In the meantime, please stay safe uh, and have a really good weekend and God bless everyone. Naka, from Suva, thank you so much. <laughs>